Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and what a fantastic morning we've had so far. Uh, not long to, make, to wait for the main event, uh, but there are a few things I want to tell you about the media battle that we wage in UKIP. Now, the first of which won't surprise you very much, and that's quite simply that the leader of a party is the most uh, priceless and positive media asset that party has. Uh, the leader is the chief strategist, decision maker, and communicator. Uh, that won't have surprised you either. What may surprise you, though, I think, uh, is uh, an assessment of just how much more important the leader is as a communicator in the modern media age uh, than are the rest of us combined. Uh, in the bigger, the longer established parties, a leader is perhaps 60% of what makes them electable or otherwise. Uh, in a newer party like ours, uh, you can make it 70%. And when you have a leader like Nigel Farage, uh, you can up that further. In fact, I'd say 85% of our positive impact in the media is down to the efforts of one man. Now, that leaves 15%. Uh, 10% I would accord to uh, Paul Nuttall, the best deputy leader in British politics by far. So that those of uh, you with GCSE A-star arithmetic may have worked out that leaves 5% of potential upside for all the rest of us combined. Now that's not a negligible proportion. Uh, because politics is often decided on fine margins. So if all of us who speak for this party in public can make an optimal contribution, we can help a significant amount. And that includes MEP candidates like me, uh, councillors at every level of local government, and people on social media who have identified themselves as UKIP members or sympathisers too. But now here comes the scary bit. Along with the 5% of potential upside that we can provide, uh, is a downside potentially 10 times as large if we mess up. Um, there is among media outlets unsympathetic to UKIP uh, a fairly determined bid to portray us as cranks or extremists. So if any of us behave in a cranky or extreme way, uh, that gives them a free hit. It allows the impression to take hold, potentially, that what I may in fact have been an aberration by a normally sensible person uh, somehow typifies our whole party when it does not. Uh, and uh, without trying to sound too headmasterly here, uh, I have to say it's all very well to say that UKIP must not be bound by the uh, over-straightened standards of political correctness that confine debate these days, and that's right. No one is proposing that this party should turn into a mid-90s New Labour-style pager operation where people have texted the line to take. Uh, I would never do that. It's not what the British people expect of us either. And quite frankly, I know I would rightly get short shrift from you if I ever tried. But that doesn't mean there are no sensible uh, limits when we conduct ourselves representing the party. Uh, to put it bluntly, uh, and this is the key point I need to make today, we will ask for your help in getting across our messages and our arguments that we know are the ones that drive voters towards us in the greatest numbers. And it's a vital uh, bit of help you can give us on that. Uh, the key thing is that it's our patriotic duty, all of us, to win, because we are not one of the bog standard political parties. We really believe in something important. We believe in restoring self-government to this great nation of ours. So it's our duty to maximize the chances of winning. Uh, I want UKIP to carry on being fun, but I want the fun to be waking up on the day of the results 
and seeing that we've won again. Let's make that our fun, not using the party as some kind of gentleman's club for the sheer enjoyment of provoking outrage. I think those days are gone, and we are now a party of winners. We're serious about our politics, and we'll enjoy the crestfallen look on our opponents' faces uh, when the results of elections are read out. And let's keep that in mind. Because on the big issues, the people are with us. On immigration, 70% of people say they want drastic reductions. And my goodness, those figures published yesterday, didn't that show our cases right? Uh, and under open door immigration from the EU, David Cameron has no quality control and no volume control either. So how he felt able to make a promise about the number, the number that uh, net immigration would reach, I don't know. But it's a pretty cynical politician who makes promises he can't deliver and lets the people down on one of their key public concerns. Now, on the EU, on the EU itself, more than half of those polled say they would want to leave, and they would vote to leave indeed. On foreign aid, two out of three voters uh, say they deplore the ring fence against public spending cuts that are affecting our other public services. They're not in favour of the £13 billion a year foreign aid industry. That will be the figure in the next financial year. We're the one party that says this 0.7% of GDP target is ridiculous. Uh, we know the British people are compassionate. We're compassionate too. We believe in aid for famine relief, aid for inoculating uh, babies against infectious diseases. What we don't believe in is subsidizing corrupt third world regimes. And of course, we believe that since we have an aid budget, that in times of crisis, on the home front, it should be available, or some of it at least, to help out our own communities when they've been overwhelmed by natural disasters too. And on law and order, we know that most people are with us, that they deplore this move to so-called community punishments that's been pioneered by the other three parties. I always think they're only called community punishments because it's invariably the community that gets punished. Uh, and on grammar schools, there's a massive appetite in this country for a return to the option of academic selection within the state system so that bright kids from non-privileged backgrounds can once more give all those old Etonians a run for their money. Uh, and on the European Court of Human Rights, that friend to preachers of hate and foreign criminals too. Well, let's just put it like this. Were there a referendum ever on Britain's membership of that, uh, our side would win that one by an absolute landslide. Don't we know it? And on energy prices, the other lot, Miliband, when he was in power, put through this Climate Change Act 2008 with the encouragement of David Cameron and Nick Clegg too. It puts hundreds of pounds on people's energy bills. It actually drives heavy industry away from Britain, taking much needed skilled industrial jobs with it, often relocating them in countries like India and China with lower environmental standards uh, than ours, so you don't even get any emissions reduction, precisely the opposite happens. We're the party that would sweep that away. The other three would keep it. And that's another issue where more and more people are realizing that we've got it right. But aside from immigration and EU membership itself, little is heard of these other popular policies and positions that we hold. Uh, my job is to help change that 
Uh, and your job, I would suggest, is to help me uh, by avoiding, as far as you can, the elephant traps set by us uh, in the media. Uh, and the person we need to help most of all is our brilliant leader. Uh, he's a man who works under enormous pressure and at an amazing pace, uh, I've, uh, and an intensity indeed that's difficult sometimes uh, to believe. Uh, I worked in newspapers for 25 years, turning around things very quickly for daily deadlines. Um, and I've worked for Nigel Farage for about 25 days. Uh, and I can tell you, I'm feeling the pace. <laughs> So let me ask you, everyone in this hall, let's resolve for each of us to do all we can to help him, to take just a, fra a fraction of that pressure off his shoulders, to make the job he does so brilliantly a little more manageable by not being the person who brings upon him a difficulty, a question potentially, to throw him off the messages that he wants to convey and that he knows the British people are, uh, are with us over. It might not be the most exciting thing for me to say to you that we've all got to do our work and concentrate and be responsible, but the cause is so important. It's not just a matter of manoeuvring uh, one set of people into ministerial office at the expense of another and nothing changes. We are the party that loves Britain. We are the party that believes in our country and we are the party that wants our country yet again to set an example to the rest of the countries of Europe as well. Uh, now, your enthusiasm and appetite for the fray uh, is an enormous motivating factor for those of us at the centre, and we hold even higher responsibilities uh, to focus, to work hard, to remember who we're in it fighting for, and at action days across the country, campaigning days, uh, people turning up for by-election campaigns, uh, that makes it all worthwhile for me when I see the sheer enthusiasm uh, and love of country uh, and willingness to put ourselves uh, you know, through, or the, of the members of you, to put yourselves through arduous days, knocking on doors, getting the message out there, ignoring the smears of our opponents, keeping positive because we know we have the best arguments. I would like you to give yourselves a round of applause because I'd like to say thank you for the brilliant work that UKIP members have done over the last 12 months as well. So well done. Uh, and wasn't it a great session from John Bickley and Lisa Duffy? Uh, that was a brilliant campaign because yet again, the Labour Party in this instance did its trick of compressing the campaign down to the shortest possible number of days while also maxing out the postal vote. So postal votes going out before all the candidates have even been confirmed, that seems pretty strange politics to me. Uh, it's deliberately designed to make it much harder for an insurgent party, a party challenging the Lib Lab Con, uh, to get momentum in a campaign. But uh, anyone who knows Lisa knows that momentum begins the moment she arrives in the constituency. <laughs> and that happened in Withenshaw as well. Uh, and John Bickley really took the battle to the Labour Party there. And when he said, in the, the thing I remember, and I'm afraid I do remember politics in sound bites to an extent, that the Labour Party has betrayed the working people of this country, and more and more of them realise it. So there are twice as many of us as there were after the general election of 2010. Uh, we do have, as uh, a journalist put it to me today, uh, to deal with that problem, the problem of growing pains, of growing fast. Uh, and it's a very unusual problem in British politics today. I don't think the other parties have put forward the idea that party membership is a dying thing. Just because 
their own policies don't appeal to normal people, their own memberships slide, and how many members has David Cameron lost uh, in the years when he's been Tory leader? Well, I think, I think probably over 100,000, is it, have gone. And uh, I say, let's keep Dave in office because he's doing us great service. <laughs> but we face the opposite problem, and it's a problem I much prefer. We're like the football club with rising gates every week. We're climbing the tables. We're getting there step by step. And uh, we believe that we can, if we all work together and do our work responsibly, we can win those European elections. Uh, but let's not forget the man who will lead us to that, who will make by far the biggest contribution we all must support, is our brilliant leader, our irrepressible leader. And I'd like to welcome to the stage and for you all to give the most fantastic welcome to the man who's inspired me to come into politics full time, Nigel Farage.